Welcome to the Leadernomic Show. I'm with John Francois Manzoni, the new incoming Dean and also President of IMD. Welcome to the show. Really glad to have you here with us. My pleasure. Tell us a bit about what brings you to Malaysia. Uh, I'm giving a speech tomorrow at the HRDF Annual Forum. Um, and while I was here, I thought I would meet some of the organizations with, uh, with whom we work. And uh, somewhere along the line, I guess, uh, our two organizations uh, got together and decided that it would be a good idea for me to uh, swing by this afternoon. Okay, and, and, and tell us a little bit about IMD and the work that you do or you will be doing in IMD. Uh, IMD, Mid-Size Independent Business School. Um, so the words are important. Mid-Size means that in some areas, for example, the MBA program, we are much smaller than many. Uh, we have one class of 90 people a year. Executive MBA, we are about mid-size. We are much larger than most on executive development. So uh, we do more continuing education and less degree programs mm -hmm. than most schools. We mm -hmm. are independent, meaning that there's only the business school. There's no engineering school, social science school. Um, and we're a business school, meaning that we're not a consulting firm. We are really an academic institution. Yeah, but you win a lot of awards and you're recognized many, many years in a row as one of the best business schools out there. Um, uh, yes, so we are of course modest about these things because there's of, of course a multitude of awards and, and you know, in, in, in reality we do very well on some and we do slightly less well on others. But yes, there are a number of uh, ratings on which we have done really well, particularly on the executive education side. Uh, and you know, we're gratified by this and at the same time we're also very mindful that uh, the world keeps evolving and we need to continue to improve every year. So there's no sense of complacency whatsoever. Okay. I should have said maybe one last thing. IMD is initially located in Switzerland. Uh, so we have our main campus in, in Switzerland. We also have uh, a small campus in Singapore. Okay. And we've also been operating worldwide uh, for many years. Uh, but well, in terms of physical operations, we have one in Lausanne and one in Singapore. And you've been teaching leadership for some time now. How did you get into this whole academic leadership space? Um, so, as an academic, I got into academia because I was interested in understanding better specific phenomena. Also because I very much enjoy teaching. Um, so, I, I think my initial uh, interest was more on the teaching side than on the research side. And then I discovered the research side and realized that I enjoyed research a lot. I did not start out as a leadership researcher. In fact, if I can tell you a secret that will now be shared with a few million people, I actually started out as a chartered accountant okay. uh, 35 years ago. And, and why? Because I was an immigrant in Canada and my father said uh, chartered accountancy is a good thing. Chartered accountants always have a job. So I was relatively good in most subjects, so I became a chartered accountant. And then. As I was working as a chartered accountant, uh, we started computerizing a lot of our clients' systems. And, and, and I realized that the problem was not the computerization, it was the people. So then when I got to Harvard to do my PhD, uh, I worked with Bob Kaplan, who was at the time developing activity-based costing, and then Balanced Scorecard. And again, the problem very quickly stopped being the technical aspects of activity-based costing and Balanced Scorecard, and became instead the fact that the people were not doing, quote unquote, what they were supposed to do. And so it was really over, I would say, a period of 10 years that I started with a more technical uh, focus and, and became increasingly focused on the behavioral and organizational aspects, uh, first of accounting, then more generally about performance measurement. And over the last 20 years, I've now you know, really developed more specifically that aspect. So I didn't start out as a leadership researcher. I became a leadership and organization development researcher because I guess this is where the phenomenon t took me. Mm. And, and you traveled, I mean, you, you lived in Singapore for a while and a number of different places around the world, right? Yes. Is, is there a fundamental difference in terms of leadership styles, capabilities, cultures that are different in different countries or different areas? So you've used three words, styles, capabilities, cultures. And, and of course, I understand that these words are related, but they're all so different, right? So, uh, let me not try to take the three of them, uh, but give maybe a more general answer. One, there is no doubt that there are uh, differences across national cultures along a range of dimensions. And what you expect from leaders is one of the dimensions where we observe differences. Um, for example, one of the dimensions that has been measured for years and years is power distance. 
how much distance is there between a boss and a subordinate. Here, Asia, of course, is a very wide sure. and heterogeneous environment, and so power distance will vary across countries. It so happens that Malaysia historically has been right. a country where the power distance tends to be right. relatively high. In fact, we are number one um, in the world, I think. Uh, on on some on some indeed yeah. on some of these, yes. So, uh, so we observe differences across countries in terms of what people expect from leaders. Um, we also uh, ex observe differences in terms of the way people communicate. So, one of the big differences is high context versus low context cultures. So, if I take an, an example, uh, Japan is the ultimate high context culture, the US is the ultimate low context culture. Uh, low context means people expect things to be very, very clear, very, very explicit. High context means we don't expect things to be very explicit. In fact, we expect to be reading between the lines and to be very, very sensitive to different cues. Uh, and so, again, one of the things you uh, realize as I mean, I'd lived in the US, I'd lived in France, in Switzerland, in Canada, but that was mostly the Western world. When I arrived in Singapore, one of the things I realized is I wasn't paying enough attention to subtle cues because I, I had lived mostly in somewhat low context cultures where things are relatively clear. Uh, and so I had to learn to pay a lot more attention to a lot more stuff. Um, and now it's quite striking when I see folks who are less used to functioning in Asia and I see them arriving, I'm thinking, mm, you're going to have to learn to pay attention. So, no doubt, leadership expression is going to differ across countries. But at the same time, we also have to remember human beings are human beings all over the world. And I think what unites us and what makes us similar is much larger than what separates us. So, yes, leaders have got to learn to adjust and adapt as they go from one environment to another. At the same time, there are some principles. Mm -hmm. The practices will differ, but the principles remain. Okay. Okay, we'll be taking a quick break and be right back here on the Leader Anonymous Show. Welcome back to the Leader Anonymous Show. I'm with Professor Manzoni here in Malaysia and you know just now you were mentioning a little bit about there are subtle nuances in different countries that leaders need to be aware of. Um, in the, if, if you talk about teaching leadership which is what you do, right. is there a difference in terms of the approach that needs to be taken in different countries in terms of delivering leadership development? So here there is an interesting nuance uh, that I hope I'll be able to explain well. I never thought of myself as someone who teaches leadership because I am not fundamentally convinced that leadership can be taught. Okay. But I am pretty convinced that leadership can be learned. So what's the difference? The difference is I think what we try to do is we try to create a context where individuals who are in a situation of leadership, remember at IMD we do mostly continuing education, we don't teach undergraduates, so, so we always work with people who have a certain experience. So we try to create a context where these individuals will become more willing and more able to learn from their and from others' experiences and to continue to develop over the years. Um, there's been a, a, a very famous question, are leaders born or made? Mm -hmm. I think that all the scientific evidence from the last few decades suggests that the answer is yes, leaders are born and made, but the made part is quite important. And so it is possible to help people learn new skills, new behavioral responses. So I think that's what I do. I, I help people learn new behavioral responses. How much of that I teach? Yes, on occasion I bring obviously some frameworks, some research findings, some insights. You know, obviously I'm not just a facilitator. Um, but again, I don't think we teach leadership as much as we help people learn leadership. Okay, fair enough. Well, one of the things that you postulate is that great leaders need to be hard of hearing. Uh, you've mentioned that uh, today, actually, in one of mm -hmm. our sessions. Tell us a little bit about that and what that means. So, uh, over the last few years, we've, we've put a lot of emphasis, we being all of us, the academic community, the consulting community, the press, uh, uh, everybody has put a lot of emphasis on leaders need to listen, they need to be open, and, and this is true. Uh, leaders need to listen, they need to be open. But uh, when you're in a position of leadership, one of the things you realize is everybody has an opinion. Uh, and, and by the way, they don't have the same opinion with one another. Or by the way, they don't even have the same opinion between 8 a.m. and 12. Huh? So, so one of the things you've got to learn as a leader is to find your way um, 
amidst all of this rather confusing feedback. By the way, this confusing feedback comes on top of a confusing reality, uh, which is again evolving very rapidly. So at some point, what you've got to be able to do, I think, is you've got to be able to press the mute button and, and say, look, thank you very much. This has been quite helpful. Uh, and now uh, we're going to go in this direction. So I I'm not saying that leaders should be hard of hearing. I'm saying they have to be capable of being hard of hearing. I am also saying that they should be very careful not to become deaf. And there is a very fine line between hard of hearing and deaf. So I think hard of hearing is a good thing. It's not only okay, but it's a good thing because it gives leaders the opportunity to stay focused and also, frankly, to self-preserve a little bit. You cannot be taking on the pain of the whole world onto your shoulders, right? Uh, and you don't want to be changing your mind constantly because of the feedback you get. You've got to be able to be focused, to be persistent. Uh, I call this being hard of hearing or having the ability to become hard of hearing, but not deaf. Right, so mute your, mute, have a mute button, but not... Uh, the mute button should be turned on and off. You see, when you watch TV on occasion, you press mute. You don't watch the whole TV the whole evening with mute. And I think what happens sometimes with, with senior leaders is they press the mute button and, and it, stays, it, stays, it stays on for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, and they end up walking, or walking around with a shield, very okay. thick shield ahead of them. And one of the things that leaders need to understand is if you're not connected to your own emotions, you cannot connect to other people's emotions. And if you cannot connect with their emotions, there's no way you can engage them. To connect others, you've got to be able to connect. To engage others, you've got to be able to connect. To connect with them, you've got to be connected with yourself. Right. And so one of the things you'll be doing in a couple of weeks is taking, up, taking that step to become a leader of your organization, IMD, as you become the president of uh, IMD. So what do you think are some of the challenges as, as, as the new leader uh, of this appointed institution that you'll be facing and what are some things you think you'll be able to overcome? So, like every organization in the world, we're evolving in an environment that is in some part favorable and another part unfavorable. Um, we are dealing, for example, with um, a very transformational impact of technology. And in some cases, or in some ways, this is disruptive, meaning it's not particularly good for us. Uh, but we can also look at it as an extraordinary opportunity. Technology can allow us to do our work better, more effectively, and more efficiently. So certainly there are strategic challenges. Uh, there are challenges with respect to the product portfolio. Um, but say like digital learning, for example. Yes. It's one big challenge that could potentially cannibalize your core business too. Yes, and at the same time, we also have a research center, which we developed in partnership with Cisco, uh, that focuses specifically on understanding the digital business transformation process and where we currently offer um, uh, educational and uh, advisory services to organizations that are facing digital challenges. So, yes, we are facing a digital challenge ourselves. At the same time, we are working with organizations to help them do this. So, there are, again, strategic challenges, products and services and so on. And then there are personal challenges. See, one of the big difference between academic leaders and corporate leaders is normally as a corporate leader, you are first a small leader, then a medium-sized mm -hmm. leader, and then a big leader. Uh, in academia, we don't have this uh, leadership pipeline. So you go from you know, being pretty much a faculty member who's working as a consultant and a coach to suddenly uh, right, being right. the boss of uh, you know, a few hundred people, uh, some of whom are faculty members. Uh, and of course, uh, how difficult to manage faculty members are has been vastly exaggerated, but nevertheless, they're also not particularly easy. So, voilà. so then there are personal challenges for me in terms of going from this role to that role. On one hand, I kind of know about this because I've been advising CEOs uh, in this process for decades, except now it's happening to me. So, voilà. so there's business challenges, there's personal challenges. Uh, overall, IMD is in a good position. Um, we have always emphasized impact. And so the world increasingly is asking business schools, what do we have to show for so many years, yeah. days of training? Uh, it's been a lot of investment in time and money and energy. What's the ROI? Right? What's the return on investment? Um, and, and so because we've always been focused on delivering programs and interventions with impact, I think we're in a good place. But again, the world is moving fast and, and so 
I'm taking over after a colleague who, by the way, is a good friend and who will remain with IMD. So there is no dramatic, uh, there's no trauma at the head of the organization. There's simply uh, an opportunity for us to take a good look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and maybe indeed accelerate a little bit some of the um, uh, initiatives and some of the movement in some areas. Okay, we're going to take another quick break and be right back here on the Leader Economics Show. Welcome back to the Leadonomic Show. I'm here with Professor Manzoni from IMD. You know, we were talking about IMD just now and the challenges that you would be facing coming in as the new president. Um, and you talked about one of the ways to overcome it is the impact that you would offer organization. Could you give us a couple of examples of how that would work? Sure. So, again, beyond the degree programs, we work with executives who either come from different organizations into one open program or are sent by one organization as a part of a custom program. When people come as a part of an open program, the question in terms of impact is how much uh, sustainable, lasting, and observable difference is there going to be in the people's behavior and effectiveness back at work? So we have been measuring business schools all over the world measure what we call happy sheets. Uh, you know, At the end of the program, are people happy with what they did? For years, we've been trying to go beyond that and say, you know, can we also revisit this six months after people have gone uh, from the program and see what they're using and what is remaining? Uh, beyond the measurement as such, we are very focused on ensuring that there will be that impact. So increasingly, we are trying to offer more support for longer after the program. We're in the process of integrating apps that people will be able to use after the program, okay. uh, integrating and building on some of the learning that they did during the program. So in open programs, uh, it's really about the way the program is designed and delivered and also how much continuity you offer after the program to make sure that there is real implementable change and implemented change. On the custom program side, the impact often is in terms of new ideas, in terms of new businesses, uh, that have been identified as a part of the projects, for example, that people worked on. Right now we're working with uh, a large organization in Singapore where the top 20 has been working on 20 different teams on a number of different streams. Uh, recently there were the presentation to the very top management of the company and six of these projects have been identified as real potential businesses that the company can, um, invest, in, can right? invest in. So. So it is really about ensuring that individuals, teams, and ultimately uh, large uh, numbers of teams are able to implement some of the learning and are also able to continue to learn uh, and to continue their development journey after the program. Okay, that's great. I I've got two questions of advice from you. You know, one is if a person was just finishing university, coming out to the workspace, and they came to you for advice, um, what sort of advice would you give this young person? Huh, it's an interesting question. So I guess I should think about it because I have four sons. And so... Um, you might have to do that soon. I right? might have to do that soon, yeah. In fact, arguably, I've been, I've been, I've been starting for a while. So um, I think one of the things I would say is focus on what you give uh, before you focus on what you get. Now, don't forget to think about what you're getting but focus a lot on what you give. Try to create value before you capture it. Um, I think another thing I would say is continue to learn. And, and that means have a, have a practice that will lead to learning. Because you know, learning doesn't fall off the sky and hit us on the head, right? You, you, you have to capture the insights. And if you want to capture the insights, you have to identify them. So I would say develop a practice, a reflective practice, where once a day or once a week you stop, and you look back and you say, what have I learned this week? Um, what would I have done differently? Uh, the faster you learn, the steeper your learning curve will be. Um, the third thing I might say uh, is, as much as possible, try to be honest. Uh, you've got one reputation, you've got one brand. Uh, try to be of use to the world and um, try to create value around you and try to do this if, you know, in as honest a way as possible. Those, those, those would be three thoughts. Okay, it's great. You know? Now, if I, if I ask another piece of advice, but this time to a group of CEOs, 
um, what you know if you could give just one or two key nuggets of wisdom to them um, that you would impart to them say in an audience or so what what would be those one or two key things that you'd impart to them uh, with CEOs it's more difficult because there's so many different aspects on which I could focus um, I think one of the areas uh, we could say typically as a CEO you are in charge of trying to steer the organization and for that you have to capture the hearts and minds so I one of the pieces of advice could be try to be clear on what the direction is try to craft that direction in a way which is exciting and which captures the imagination a French poet uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said very nicely if you want people to build a boat uh, don't come up with blueprints and uh, hammers and nails. Make them love the vast and endless sea. So I, I think too often uh, we live in a world where there's a lot of signposts and no destination. Let's identify an exciting place where we want to go and, and then let's try to marshal resources in that direction. Let's also try to be able to sell the pain of the journey. I think one of the characteristics of great leaders is they can help people to accept delayed gratification. Uh, there is no progress of any kind without some form of delayed gratification. You've got to invest time and energy today and there'll be some returns tomorrow. So try to find some exciting goal uh, that will then allow people to invest time and energy in order to reach that, um, that goal later on. Okay, that's great. And, and I want to end with a question a little bit on research, right? I mean, there's tons of different pieces of leadership research that's coming out, you know, whether it's on the brain or whether it's uh, uh, psychology and other pieces. For yourself, what do you think are some new insights on leadership or research on leadership that you think are game-changing and that you think are something that we need to, you know, as, as leaders, we need to take to heart uh, that's coming out uh, in this world today? Sure. Uh, you're referring to research on the brain. I think one of the fundamental insights of the last few years is neurons that fire together, wire together. What we now understand increasingly well is why people come on programs, are excited and energized by the program, and then go back, and in spite of all their excitement, time and energy, revert back to type. Yeah. And they revert back to type because their behavior is guided by a set of neural connections where the neurons have fired together thousands, millions of times over decades. And during the program, a new set of connections have fired two, three, four, five times. And if you have five times on this side and, and a million times time on that side, guess who wins? Uh, so I think this has been extremely important because it has helped us understand how we need to proceed differently in leadership development programs in order to, hey, help executives to gain more awareness and then B, uh, go about developing more of a practice uh, discipline and then more of a reflective discipline, all the while also becoming more mindful because if you're not mindful, the habit wins. So these discoveries have really changed rather profoundly how we understand leadership development and then the interventions that we design and deliver. Mm. But how, how would you execute on some of these things? Because it's not easy to, to ensure practice happens, to ensure that these new neurons keep firing post-program. Yeah. Post so, you know? so, well, no, of course it's not. And you also have to remember, we work with adults, and in some cases, we work with very senior adults. So uh, we don't uh, force them to do much of anything. But A, we can create more of a desire to keep doing this. Two, we can give them uh, practices. We can suggest to them, offer to them practices, uh, which once they start implementing them, yield benefits. As they yield benefits, you can see these very experienced folks go, hey, this actually works. And then we also help them understand the power of rituals. Right? Uh, Sometimes people go, ah, oh, you know, I, I was doing this mindfulness thing, it really worked, and I don't know, now it no longer works. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it no longer works because you stopped practicing it. So uh, can we ensure that people do it? No. Uh, can we offer ideas and practices that will help them? Yes. Also, in a number of programs, we're introducing post-program uh, follow-up follow and post-program insights and, and connections. And again, that's where the apps could be useful, mm -hmm. right? If you get a message once a day or once every two days or three times a day from an app asking you, have you thought of this, have you thought of that, or inviting you to enter a thought and a reflection, 
then we're helping you to internalize the discipline. Again, the technology on one side is a disruptor. We are less thoughtful today than we were years ago because we are constantly bombarded with information. And yet the technology can also be an amazing asset because it can also help us remember that we need to do one, two, and three. Fabulous. John Francois, thank you so much for being here on the show. We wish thank you, you for all the best. Me. We wish you all the best in your journey in trying to take IMD to new heights. And I'm sure you'll succeed. So all You're the best kind. to you. Thank you. Thank you.